विकसित भारत की संकल्पना ये एक बहुत बड़ी संकल्पना भी है बहुत बड़ी सोच भी है क्योंकि जब हम कल्चर की बात करते हैं भारतीय संस्कृति की बात करते हैं वो भारतीय संस्कृति सभी के लिए बहुत महत्वपूर्ण आज से नहीं बहुत समय से रही है पांच हजार साल पुरानी संस्कृति के बारे में जिसमें कि अनेकों साल अब जुड़ते ही जा रहे हैं हम इतिहास पढ़ते थे तब पांच हजार साल पुरानी संस्कृति कहते थे तो आप सोच लीजिए कि ये कितनी पुरानी संस्कृति है सदियों से चली आने वाली और कभी कभी जब वेदों को देखते हैं तो कहा जाता है कि वो आर्श शब्द है और उनको बनाने वाले उनके निर्माताओं के बारे में पता नहीं है वो तो देववाणी ही है ऐसी संस्कृति की बात है आधुनिक समय में बात करूं तो जिसको कहते हैं कि सॉफ्ट पॉलिसी भारत की एक सॉफ्ट पॉलिसी है पूरे वर्ल्ड के लिए पूरे संसार के लिए हम लोगों ने एक ऐसी पॉलिसी बनाई है हम उद्योग करते हैं हम व्यापार करते हैं हम उन लोगों के साथ तरी तरी के कूटनीतिक संबंधों संबंध बनाते हैं लेकिन जो सबसे स्थायी संबंध बन सकता है वो हमारी कल्चरल पॉलिसी के द्वारा और हमारे सांस्कृतिक विस्तार के द्वारा ही हो सकता है कभी कभी हमको लगता होगा जैसे देश के बहुत सारे लोग जो हैं मीडिया में देखते होंगे बच्चे सोचते होंगे कि क्यों दूसरे देशों में जाकर ये इस तरीके के अपने कार्यक्रम कर रहे हैं क्यों हमारे जो लोक नृत्य है या जो हमारे क्लासिकल नृत्य हैं और जो गान हैं उनको हम क्यों वहां पर जाकर दिखा रहे हैं क्या वहां के लोग उसको समझ पाएंगे ऐसा नहीं है वहां के बहुत सारे ऐसे लोग हैं जो कि यहाँ पर आकर पढ़ते हैं बनारस में एक लड़की से मैं मिली वो चाइना की लड़की थी और उसने अपना नाम रखा हुआ था सीता और वो यहाँ पर भारतीय संस्कृति का पाठ तो पढ़ ही रही थी बनारस हिंदू यूनिवर्सिटी के अंदर साथ ही साथ जो है वो यहाँ का जो क्लासिकल खास तौर पे उत्तर प्रदेश में जो कथक नृत्य है उसको भी वो सीख रही थी असल में भारत के विकास पहले भी बाकी चीजों के साथ साथ सांस्कृतिक रूप से ही बहुत ज्यादा था और आज यदि हम भारत को विकसित भारत बनाने की बात करते हैं या भारत के विकसित होने की बात करते हैं तो सांस्कृतिक विकास सांस्कृतिक संबंध सांस्कृतिक जो हमारे मूल्य है उन सबको पूरे में फैलाना ही ये हमारा जो है बहुत बड़ा काम है और क्योंकि जो युवा वर्ग है युवा वर्ग के बीच में जाकर इन बातों को क्यों किया जा रहा है आईजीएनसीए को मैं इस बात के लिए धन्यवाद देना चाहूंगी कि ये कार्यक्रम वो अलग अलग कॉलेजेस में कर रहे हैं आज हमारे कॉलेज में हो रहा है कल रामानुजम में हो रहा है और इससे पहले भी कई कॉलेज में हुए और आगे ये इस तरीके की श्रृंखला जो है लगातार बनी रहेगी इसका हमें पूरा विश्वास है तो आईजीएनसी ये बहुत बड़ा काम कर रहा है इस रूप में कि युवाओं को स्वयं अपने देश की संस्कृति के साथ जोड़ रहा है संस्कृति का ज्ञान करा रहा है और साथ ही साथ अपनी संस्कृति के प्रति हमारे मन में आत्म सम्मान की बात जो है वो पैदा कर रहा है हमें बिल्कुल ये नहीं सोचना है कि पश्चिमी संस्कृति के प्रति रुझान रखने वाले जो लोग हैं या जो उसको बहुत अच्छा मानने वाले लोग हैं उन युवाओं को ये पता होना चाहिए कि हमारी संस्कृति जितनी स्थायी संस्कृति है और जितनी मूल्यवान संस्कृति है हम किसी संस्कृति की बुराई नहीं करना चाहते हैं लेकिन आपकी अपनी संस्कृति एकदम बराबरी में ही नहीं बल्कि ऊपर खड़ी है हम विकसित हैं हम आर्थिक दृष्टि से भी किसी जमाने के अंदर हमारी जो आर्थिक स्थिति थी हमारा जो जी था वो उन सारे देशों से ज्यादा था जिन्होंने हमारे ऊपर आकर राज किया लेकिन हम अपनी उन कमजोरियों पर अब विजय पा चुके हैं और अब जो है इस विजय के परचम को पूरी दुनिया के अंदर लहराना और उन्हें मनवाना जरूरी है तो इस तरीके के कार्यक्रमों के लिए मैं आई को बहुत धन्यवाद देती हूँ इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल सेंटर फॉर द आर्ट्स इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट प्रीमियर एंड वन ऑफ द लार्जेस्ट आर्ट एंड कल्चरल इंस्टीट्यूशन इन द वर्ल्ड नॉट जस्ट इन इंडिया इट प्रजर्व इट प्रमोट डिसिमिनेट Indian cultural heritage. So, in this context, like uh, when we uh, thought of this series, first of all, uh, let me give you some ideas why this series is required. I think most of us who have born after independence, हम लोगों ने जो पढ़ा है, जो हम लोगों ने 
इंडियन हिस्ट्री के बारे में इंडियन कल्चर के बारे में आप हमारी कल्चरल ट्रेडिशंस के बारे में हमारी ज्ञान परंपरा के बारे में जो भी पढ़ा है क्या पढ़ा है उसके पीछे एक बहुत बड़ी हिस्ट्री है और वो हिस्ट्री क्या है आज आप सबसे ज्यादा डेवलप्ड किन कंट्रीज को मानते हैं रिसर्च और एजुकेशन में यूएस दूसरा चाइना क्योंकि अगर आज उनका वर्ल्ड रिसर्च आउटपुट देखें तो दे आर प्लेस्ड एट नंबर वन एंड टू एंड हाउ मेनी इयर्स मे बी लास्ट हंड्रेड इयर्स फिफ्टी इयर्स बट डू यू नो इंडिया वॉज लीडिंग दिस एरेना फॉर थाउजेंड्स ऑफ इयर्स आज भी हमारे पास एक करोड़ से ज्यादा हैंड रिटर्न मैनुस्क्रिप्ट हैं जिनकी की संख्या कम से कम आप इसको मल्टीप्लाई कर सकते हैं टेन टाइम्स दस करोड़ हमारे पास थी हुआ क्या मुगल इन्वेजन हुआ तो कोई भी इन्वेडर आता है वो सबसे पहले आपकी एजुकेशन के ऊपर अटैक करता है आपकी कल्चर के ऊपर अटेंड करता है क्योंकि आपकी जो सिविलाइजेशन है जो आपका आपकी संस्कृति है अगर वो जिंदा रहेगी तो दे के नॉट सर्व देर पर्पस और हम कितने सालों हजारों साल उस इन्वेजन के शिकार रहे नालंदा यूनिवर्सिटी में मैनुस्क्रिप्ट जलाई गई हर कोई जानता है इस चीज को तो हुआ क्या कि जैसे मुगल इन्वेजन स्टार्ट हुआ हमारी जो हमारा खुद का एजुकेशन था जो हम लीडर थे वर्ल्ड लीडर थे एजुकेशन में क्योंकि उसका हमारे पास पूरा एविडेंस है पूरे वर्ल्ड की अगर मैनुस्क्रिप्ट को आप काउंट करके देखेंगे आपको एक करोड़ नहीं मिलेंगी हमारे देश में एक करोड़ आज भी हैं इससे बड़ा कोई भी एविडेंस नहीं हो सकता कि हाउ वी वर एडवांस इन टर्म्स ऑफ एजुकेशन मुगल्स के बाद ब्रिट यूरोपियंस आए दे डू द सेम थिंग उन्होंने भी वही चीजें की कि बट दे दे डिड सर्टन थिंग वेरी स्मार्टली जो मुगल्स हजारों आठ साल में नहीं कर पाए यूरोपियन ने वो दो साल में किया उन्होंने क्या किया मुगल इन्वेडर सिर्फ डिस्ट्रॉय कर रहे थे चीजों को लेकिन यूरोपियन ने उसको रीराइट करना शुरू कर दिया जो उनको सूट करता था जो उनको क्योंकि उनको हिंदुस्तान को क्या प्रूव करना था कि इंडिया इज ए वेरी अनसिविलाइज कंट्री इट्स ए कंट्री ऑफ स्नेक चार्मर्स वेरी पुअर दे डोंट नो सिविलाइजेशन दे डोंट नो डेवलपमेंट और वो फिलोसफी कैसे प्रूव होती उनकी कि वो हमें प्रूव करते हैं कि हम उस कैपेबल नहीं है और उनका पर्पज क्या देन दे जस्टिफाइड वाई दे आर रूलिंग इंडिया उस जस्टिफिकेशन के लिए स्लोली स्लोली दे स्टार्ट चेंजिंग दैटर्न दे स्टार्ट ओपनिंग कॉलेज एंड ये बताने के लिए देखिए यहां पर तो एजुकेशन सिस्टम ही नहीं है जबकि हमारे हजारों साल गुरुकुल सिस्टम हमारा एक बहुत ही वेल डेवलप्ड एजुकेशन सिस्टम था लेकिन उन्होंने मॉडर्न कॉलेज के नाम पर जो एक यूरोपियन एजुकेशन सिस्टम को यहाँ इंट्रोड्यूस किया इंट्रोड्यूस किया वो अच्छी बात है लेकिन उन्होंने उसको रीराइट किया उन्होंने बहुत सारी चीजों को इवन मनुस्मृति की बात करें दे वर ट्राइंग टू फाइंड आउट कि ऐसा कोई हम कह सकें हिंदू ग्रंथ तो मनुस्मृति को उन्होंने बहुत सारी चीजें उसमें चेंजेस करके ये बताने की कोशिश की कि ये हमारा हिंदू रिलीजन का एक वो बाइबल है जो भी जहां उनको लगता था कि दे कैन मैनुपुलेट द थिंग्स दे डिड इट इंडिपेंडेंस 1947 में आजाद हुए लेकिन 200 साल में हमारे बहुत सारे अपने खुद के लोग एजुकेशन यूरोपियन यूनिवर्सिटीज में पढ़ के आए यहां पर पढ़ के आए और उन्होंने वही पढ़ा जो ब्रिटिशर्स चाहते थे क्योंकि हमारी ये मैनुस्क्रिप्ट किस लैंग्वेजेस में है पाली प्रकृति ब्राह्मी शारदा जो कि मैं और आप नहीं पढ़ सकते और उस समय की जनरेशन भी नहीं पढ़ सकती क्योंकि वो 800, 900, हजारों साल में वो लिपियां ही खत्म होती शुरू बहुत सेलेक्टेड संत और जो स्कॉलर्स रह गए जो उनको पढ़ सकते थे तो किसी ने उनको डिसाइफर ही नहीं किया जो हमारी ज्ञान परंपरा थी कभी हमारे सामने वो आई नहीं तो ये जो इतना बड़ा गैप था और इंडिपेंडेंस के बाद जो होना चाहिए कि हमें वो सारी मैनेज वो आईजेंसी ने डिसाइफर किया नाइनटीन 87 में आईजीएनसी बनने के बाद हमने कम से कम 1000 बुक्स हैं पब्लिश की हैं, लेकिन वो किताबें जितनी भी पब्लिश हुई वो आम आदमी तक पहुंची नहीं तो जो एक इंडोलॉजिकल क्लास ऑफ स्कॉलर्स थे वही वही तक सीमित रह गई 
क्योंकि आईजीएनसी ने रिसर्च तो बहुत की लेकिन उसको शेयर नहीं किया बाहर यूनिवर्सिटीज में कॉलेजेस में जिससे कि वो सही जानकारी जो लोगों तक पहुंचनी चाहिए वो नहीं पहुंची तो हमारा जो इस कल्चरल पॉलिसी चौपाल का जो मेरा मकसद है क्योंकि मैं आ, इस एजेंसी को रिप्रेजेंट कर रहा हूं यहां पर कि जो हमारी यंगर जनरेशन है दे शुड नो द ट्रूथ दे शुड फील दे शुड टेक प्राइड इन आवर लेगेसी जो प्राइम मिनिस्टर कहते हैं एंड आई आई एम टेलिंग यू वंस यू नो द ट्रूथ यू ऑटोमेटिकली फील वेरी एज ए प्राउड इंडियन हम तब तक नहीं समझ पाते जब तक हम जानते नहीं है लेकिन जिस दिन जानना शुरू करेंगे हमें किसी को बत, हम किसी को कोई भाषण देने की जरूरत ही नहीं हम खुद ही बिलीव करना शुरू कर देंगे कि वी आर वन ऑफ द मोस्ट डेवलपमेंट कंट्री इन द पास्ट जो हम विश्व गुरु बनने की बात कर रहे हैं हम थे वो एक पीरियड आया जिसमें कि हर कंट्री में एक इस तरह का पीरियड आता है वो आया और वो चला गया एंड स्टिल वी हैव दैट कैपेसिटी एंड कैपेबिलिटीज टू बिकम द विश्व गुरु इसलिए नहीं कि हमें कोई वर्ल्ड को कुछ प्रूव करना है हमें सिर्फ अपने आप को प्रूव करना है कि द काइंड ऑफ कल्चरल हेरिटेज काइंड ऑफ कल्चरल ट्रेडिशंस हम क्यों ब्लाइंडली फॉलो करें कुछ चीजें जो क्योंकि ये मॉडर्नाइज करने का जो अगर इंडिकेशन है आप बताइए जो अभी सरस्वती वंदना हुई लाइटिंग ऑफ लैंप हुआ ये जो स्वागत हुआ आपको किसी भी यूरोपियन या यूएस में कहीं पर भी ये सब देखने को नहीं मिलेगा क्यों नहीं मिलेगा उनकी कभी परंपरा ही नहीं रही दे वर कंसिडर्ड बारबेरियंस दे डोंट बिलीव इन दैट काइंड ऑफ सिविलाइजेशन हम इसको हम क्यों इसको कई बार जो यंग जनरेशन सोचती है ये दक्यून ऐसी चीजें हैं बहुत ऑर्थोडॉक्स क्यों हम इस चीज को हम वी शुड टेक प्राइड कि यस वी आर रेस्पेक्टिंग अवर कल्चर वी आर रेस्पेक्टिंग अवर टीचर्स जो भी हमारे गुरुज हैं तो हम क्यों किसी को कॉपी करें I was the member of the plagiarism regulation committee of UGC. तो जब ये plagiarism regulation draft हो के ministry में गए, तो उन्होंने पूछा कि world के किस किस country में regulation implement हुए हैं। तो UGC के जो chairman थे उस समय उन्होंने मुझसे कहा कि रमेश, I think you should defend it and you should respond to them। कि तो मैंने कहा किसी भी country में नहीं। We are the first country to promote this, come out with this regulation। कहते नहीं हमें क्यों जब किसी country ने नहीं बनाया तो हम ही क्यों बनाएं? And I don't think this is a valid reason. अगर कोई चीज हमारे लिए सूट करती है हमारे एजुकेशन सिस्टम को सूट करती है हमारे हमारे लिए जरूरत है तो वी शुड कम आउट विद रेगुलेशन विच सूट अवर कंट्री वाई वी शुड अगर इस बात को लेके कि हम यूएस में नहीं है या यूरोप में नहीं है हम इसको ना बनाए तो ये तो कोई रीजन नहीं हुआ एंड अल्टीमेटली मिनिस्ट्री कन्विंस एंड द रेगुलेशन इन टू थाउजेंड एटीन वर इनेक्टेड तो कहीं ना कहीं हमें पहल लेनी होगी फर्स्ट वी हैव टू शो दैट वी आर द फर्स्ट इन दैट और बहुत सारे एरियाज हैं जहां पर वी कैन बी द लीडर्स सो आई थैंक यू अवर टीम ऑफ तोरी एंड रुक्मी रुकी जी एंड ऑल माय डायर आईजीएनसी टीम फॉर दिस ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस वंडरफुल प्लेस सो आई एम गोइंग टू हैव बीन गिवन दिस लॉन्ग टॉपिक प्राइड एजुकेशन हेरिटेज एंड कल्चर व्हिच इज एक्चुअली ऑल मिक्स्ड अप इफ यू रीड माय बुक माय बुक इज अबाउट इंडियाज एजुकेशनल हेरिटेज इट्स कॉल्ड रीविजिटिंग द educational heritage of india uh, it's that's the book and i believe it's there in all the libraries in uh, delhi university and uh, i have seen copies in the uh, in us also where i'm living so that's a good thing but how many people have read the book i'm not sure a lot of people have my book and sometimes they ask me questions which show me that they have not read the book uh, so <laughs> uh, it's not i can't feel very happy right now i need to see more people who have read the book so pride i think it's good to see pride right there in the the first word because you know there are uh, when it comes to pride in our civilization as indians i think it should come very naturally to us but surprisingly it's not i'm noticing lot of indians who uh, where i live in the us and in, even in india itself they don't seem to have a great impression or they're not really proud about being indian and they have lot of complaints india mein ye hai wo hai this and that and which are which i can understand lot of things which are not right but the fact that they are indian i'm not seeing that pride and that's because they don't know enough about what we achieved in the past and that is something we need to correct we we need to go back and know our history know our itihas know our the shastras what is in our shastras because without that you really won't know what is there to be proud about and uh, for me 
from the time I have started discovering and delving, you know, more about our history, automatically it's just giving me pride. And let me tell you, there are countries which are manufacturing symbols of pride because, you know, uh, so where I was living in Singapore, it's a very small country, but they want to make people feel proud about it. So they manufacture a symbol of half lion, half fish and all that. And that's how they are creating a narrative. But for us, we don't need to do anything. We just need to be seekers of truth. And then when you go back and know your history there, the pride will come surging in. And it can be a great uh, way to motivate yourself. No, not pride for the sake of pride. Okay, I'm the greatest, per greatest person on earth. Not for that. But for using that as a motivational force, using pride to motivate yourself is very important. So let me go into my topic of uh, of our civilization, which is without parallel in terms of its education. So we have a very ancient tradition of formal discipline, teaching and uh, learning. It is so ancient that uh, we can't even put a date to it. If some people say 3,000, 5,000 years ago, some people say it's even older than that. And um, I, I believe all the versions would say that we are much older than what, we, what archaeology tells us. Because, you know, we have in our ceremonies itself, we have ceremonies related to education. We have, um, you know, we have the uh, Akshar Abhyasa or Vidya Rambha, the first time a child learns to trace the alphabets. We celebrate education at every step in all our religious ceremonies. Then there is great uh, value attached to education. So living in, uh, in the US, uh, I have seen that all the Indian origin parents, they put a lot of pressure on their children to do well in the examinations, right? And they are not happy even if they get into a good college. They want to see them in the top college. So I will see in the social media that some, uh, the Indian parents, if their children get into college, they won't even talk about it because everybody goes to college. Whereas you will see, I'll see that many white parents, so they are very happy when the child goes to college. Oh, my child has got into college. But Indians, they're just not even excited. Yeah, our child, everybody has to go to college. It's so normal for us. And that is coming from a thousand, uh, 5,000, 6,000 year old civilization where it was always understood that after school, you're going to go and go for higher education. You must try for it at least. Avidya, avidya is the greatest sin in our culture, avidya. So not being ignorant is the greatest sin in our culture. That tells you how much education is valued, okay? So remember that there were two systems of education in India. Not everybody was studying the Veda, you know, going, uh, having the open Aina ceremony and going for the Vedic learning. Many of them were learning skills, artisans, right? Even they had a separate open Aina ceremony, which was different from the Vedic ceremony. Even the military, those who went to the army, even they had a separate open Aina ceremony, okay? So it's the wrong thing to think that only these Brahmins were doing this and all that. If you go back into history, you will find that everybody is getting educated, okay? And there are gurus from every uh, every jati, every uh, varna. So Vedic education plus artisan education, these were two going parallelly. And of course, everything was influenced by the Vedas. So whatever is in the Veda was influencing all the different systems of education, okay? They were not going very far from what is in the Veda. And all of them were taking pride in their profession. So if it is a carpenter, it's a blacksmith, whatever they are, the sculptor, they were taking pride. It's not like the Brahmins on the top are the most, you know, uh, valued and all the others are not. Every jati was transmitting knowledge. So we don't see it in terms of knowledge transmission, you know. So if there is a musician who is born into a jati of musicians, they are preserving the knowledge uh, down the lineage. Uh, say a carpenter or say a vaidya. So they are to, from the vaidya jati and they are preserving that jati knowledge. So that was the culture. Okay. Now, there are, I always like to mention the gurus to whom we have to be profoundly grateful, right? Uh, Kanada, Sushruta, Charaka, Aryabhata, Varahamira, Brahmagupta, Bhaskaracharya, Panini, Patanjali, Pingala, Bharata Muni, hundreds of other gurus who have laid the foundational imprint on every discipline that we are studying today. We must remember these gurus and there are many more whose names you will come to know as you study the Shastras. So practically everything that is being taught in colleges today, if you go back to the history of when was this discipline, what is the foundation of this discipline, you will come across some guru, male or female, in Bharat Desha. So this is the fascinating thing. There is really nothing which we have not looked at in ancient times. 
maybe maybe we have advanced a bit more in terms of technology but the basic concepts we have already thought about in ancient times and this is not a tall statement i am making this is something i have discovered during my research and it surprises me every time sciences medicine math language art music philosophy environmentalism myriad other disciplines flowed out from india and provided the base on which the edifice of modern knowledge stands today now this is a map that you will find in my book uh, in this uh, this book of mine which in which i have tried to show all the ancient centers of higher knowledge not primary school knowledge but higher knowledge in different disciplines and when i started uh, mapping them out in the first book i have only about 20 centers of learning and now in my second book by the time i came to the second book i came across all, more almost 80 90 centers of learning now just to get an idea how many of you can name some universities of ancient india like put up your hand and tell me some names that you know everybody knows nalanda and takshila any other names so this is what i discovered that it's not just nalanda takshashila vikramshila so many universities every part of india is covered you can see that okay in the eastern part you have nalanda takshashila you have uh, mithila you have nadia nadia uh, mithila was nepal and bihar nadia is bengal uh, navadvi navadvip is another name uh, udantapura somapura on the eastern side and on the western side you have vallabhi university in gujarat right Vallabhi University was set up by the professors of Nalanda. Two pro two professors went from Nalanda, migrated to Gujarat, set up Vallabhi University. Imagine in those ancient times. In the north there is uh, Takshashila, which is now in Pakistan. But we should not forget Sharda Peet. I hope some people know Sharda Peet. Kashmir was known as Sharda Desh because it was the land of Sharda, whom we remember today in the Saraswati Vandana, goddess of learning. and uh, sharda peet was not just a temple where people went to worship the devi attached to the temple there was an annex there were rooms where lectures can be given where classes can be held there was a library there where all the manuscripts were kept carefully and library the culture of libraries was very predominant in india so most of these and by the way let me come to the south of india south of india so many of those centers they were mainly temple universities imagine temple universities so just like sharda peet so you have kanchipuram uh, you have ennairam you have uh, so many other all these uh, gokarna banavasi so these are all temple universities uh, universities or mathas matha was another model of uh, of a uh, teaching institution matha was very unique math which you call math matha was a place where not only teaching is going on but travelers can come and stay there so somebody who jo koi yatri us wahan se jo guzar rahe hain वो वहां पे मठ में रह सकते थे और चाहे तो वो क्लास में बैठ भी सकते थे देख सकते थे क्लास वहां पे क्लासेस हो रहे तो दे कैन जॉइन द क्लास एंड इफ दे आर नॉट फीलिंग वेल देर इज वैद्य देयर हु विल ट्रीट देम सो इमेजिन अ मल्टी पर्पज टूडे वी आर टोल्ड वी शुड हैव मल्टी पर्पज इंस्टीट्यूशन वो सब हमारे यहाँ थे यू नो यू नो वी इवन हैड समर कोर्सेज शॉर्ट स्प्रिंग कोर्सेज वी हैड शॉर्ट टर्म कोर्सेज इन एंशियंट इंडिया इट्स नॉट अ मॉडर्न डे इन्वेंशन नॉट एवरीबडी हैड टू स्टडी फॉर ट्वेल्व ईयर्स एट ईयर्स those who wanted a quick synopsis of a subject would do a, a short course so there were there was something called varshika which was during the monsoon season or there would be vasantika which is a spring season may course you know two three months ka course kar lete the ye bhi tha uh in the center there was ujjain university ujjain in madhya pradesh was famous for mathematics astronomy so even in those ancient times children who were very good in mathematics you know their parents will tell them i hope you will get a seat in ujjain university okay so at a time when there is no air travel there is no rail travel it takes weeks and months to reach a place people were traveling all over india to the college of their choice and trying to get admission and they were coming from different parts of the world it was not just india mind you so just like today we are all going to us to study we are going to europe to study but in ancient times everybody was coming to india to study india was the place bharat is the place where they knew they'll get top quality education and they can pride uh, proudly say that i got i studied in nalanda i studied in uh, 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 this uh, udantapura i studied in kantalur shala that was the way kantalur shala is is a center it was a university in kerala okay and it was considered the nalanda of the south it had even more subjects than nalanda 
it had martial arts so somebody can study the vedas and they can also study martial arts they could do that in the kantalur shala and we know that because there are rules you know you'll find rule books where they are saying that students who are uh, coming to the classroom should keep all their weapons outside the class they cannot bring the weapons into some other class because there were instances of students fighting with each other with those weapons so that that shows that it is so uh, institutionalized that all these rules have also been made okay and there are inscriptions plenty of inscriptions which uh, you will find in southern india not so much in uh, northern india in ennairam in tamil nadu you will find inscriptions where is given that those who are studying the higher mimamsa and difficult subjects will be given higher scholarship amount those who are studying the easier subjects will be given a little bit lesser amount how much money uh, how much is to be given to teachers it was not money usually grains and things like that food clothes and all would be given so this is a picture of india's education ancient education that i want to tell you if you go deeper into it you will you'll be so proud that even in those days there were admission tests uh, it was not that everybody is getting admission into the top universities we had very very difficult admission tests uh, in nalanda only 20% students were getting admission and there were coaching centers there were coaching centers which you think today it's a modern phenomenon but near nalanda in the villages lot of gurus were taking students in their house and teaching them how to crack the nalanda entrance examination and this is not just for nalanda all over because gurus were very particular about the students they want to see that this student is studying for the sake of loka kalyan not for his own kalyan and if they so they would put lot of questions to them oral kind of exam character test to see if these students are eligible to study there this is a picture of uh, the first time a child learns how to uh, write the alphabet in bengali it's called hate khodi and uh, in the rest of india it is called vidyarambha in uh, south they use gr rice grains राइस ग्रेन्स के ऊपर वो फर्स्ट टाइम अ लिखते हैं या ओम लिखते हैं तो वो उसको मनाया जाता है माय चाइल्ड इज गोइंग टू स्टार्ट लर्निंग हाउ टू रीड एंड राइट ओके दिस शोस टू यू हाउ मच इंपॉर्टेंस वी गिव टू एजुकेशन देर वाज अ फ्लरिशिंग इकोसिस्टम ऑफ लर्निंग इन इंडिया वन थिंग यू मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड वाई वर वी सो ग्रेट इन इन टर्म्स ऑफ एजुकेशन इज बिकॉज द होल इको सिस्टम अराउंड इट जस्ट लाइक इन नालंदा देर आर द गुरुज हु आर टीचिंग हाउ टू टू क्लियर द एंट्रेंस एग्जाम the whole society was supporting scholars teachers students that was the thinking that if somebody is studying then we must give respect to this person because this person is going to live a very austere life very simple life remember students were not supposed to live a luxurious life brahmacharya i'll talk, tell you about it so the entire society supported scholars financially emotionally and personally and i told you about religious ceremonies so religious ceremonies may students or teachers ko bulaya jata tha unko bhojan diya jata tha they were given respect that they are uh, on the path of education so everybody was competing in inviting students to their house and uh, you know the grihastashrama that is the time when you you are married you have a family you must make sure that every time there is a festival in the house you are celebrating invite the students and the uh, teachers so this is so fascinating that today we talk about how uh, teachers are so poorly paid in india today right teachers your engineers are paid more managers are paid more and then we say let's look at finland in finland they are they are giving so much respect to teachers and they are paid the highest and i am thinking why are you looking at finland look at our own country in our culture if there is a teacher walking by everybody will start doing pranam to that teacher that is the respect we give to teacher and so the those who got into the path of knowledge and education they did not have to worry from where their food will come from where their clothes will come from where their medicines will come from because the moment they came to know that there is one guru or one student who is not well he needs this help the society the samaj will go to help them that was our culture the kings were giving land to the gurus the kings whenever the news came that there is a great guru he is doing a great job okay let's give him land so that he can uh, more students can study with him and all the crops grown on that land can be used to feed the students okay i already told you that the people were very mobile they were traveling freely it was not like uh, because it was difficult to travel they were not traveling everybody was traveling to the institution of their choice uh the third bullet point i want to tell you about the mithila university do you all how many people know about mithila mithila was a very famous center of learning 
where every all subjects were taught and especially logic it was very famous for tarka nyaya these subjects and um, i was doing some research to find out that under which kings which rulers was mithila prospering and i was astonished to find that there was a person called nanya deva from karnataka my state karnataka he went to bihar and uh, suddenly i don't know how he became the king because people found him very resourceful very smart and they made him the king and then under him and came a dynasty the karnata dynasty where mithila flourished maithili became a language of literature art sculpture everything developed and i was wondering how come he didn't impose his own language on the people kannada was not imposed instead he is making the language of the region prosper right and the same thing i found about karnataka the raja mayur verma of karnataka invited hundreds of scholars from a place called ahitchatra now it is there in my family history i come so he invited those scholars and uh, they were experts in different fields you know vyakaran uh, you know uh, 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 what do you call this uh, etymology nirukta various other vedangas all the experts were invited to settle in karnataka and uh, teach the students over there so in my family history uh, i am supposed to be a descendant of one of those scholars who came because it's well documented we have a book 60 families which came from ahitchatra ahitchatra now my uh, mother used to say that we came from ahitchatra which is in punjab when i said so when i grew up i started looking up where is ahitchatra it is near bareilly in uttar pradesh so we then it was fascinating to me that my ancestors went from uttar pradesh to karnataka and they now are they became kannada pandits they are teaching sanskrit they are te- teaching kannada so i was wondering what was their language over there in uttar pradesh that doesn't seem to have come here instead the language of that region was promoted by my ancestors in fact they contributed a lot to kannada literature uh, so this is the fascinating thing about india that there is no north south east west if you go to the history you will find somebody has come from some other part of the country and settled there and made it a great place of learning and uh, governance and so on now why i have this slide is that in india when i was growing up there was a lot of uh, pressure to study engineering to study sciences i i don't know if today it's the same situation always sciences maths and uh, engineering were kept at the top and languages and humanities were you know considered to be for chill students were not so good in uh, studies but if you go into our history if you go into our uh, itihas uh, our gyana uh, parampara you will find that there is no difference between history science uh, english i mean uh, languages everything was considered knowledge and they were all equal okay and most interestingly we were we were looking at language like a science language was approached like a science now look at the western languages uh, whether you look at english or any other language if you see the arrangement of the letters a b c d e f g there is no logic there is no logic in why a b comes after a c comes after b right it's just some random order look at sanskrit look at hindi look at kannada look at all the indian languages you will find they are arranged in the order in the way they are pronounced from your throat from your so k k g g comes from this part of your throat kantha kanthya it is called in sanskrit then they have next comes ch ch j j n yeah that comes from a little bit higher from here right they are the talavya then you have the murdhanya t t d d n we are hitting the palate t t d right you say it you will know where it's coming from they are kept in uh, kept in uh, together in sequence t th d d n you are using your teeth dantya t th you have to use your teeth to pronounce them then you have p p b b m where you are using the lips so ostia now look at our gurus that the way they approach language is so logical scientific scientific means logical it was part of our system and then when you look at our grammar grammar is super logical the rules of grammar that you have if you see the way they have made all the rules rules on rules meta rules right which is what people say is very similar to programming today programming is also all about rules and meta rules so that is the way that our ancestors made no distinction between science and language they were all scientific all of them were scientific now i think some of you might find this interesting that europe did not accept the decimal system for centuries i am sure you all know that india gave the decimal system to the world and today we take it for granted i mean what is there to even think about it the way we write a number 
is using you know the decimal system but think of a time when there was no decimal system in the european world in no other part of the world except in india in india we are using the decimal system the rest of the world doesn't know and the way they are writing numbers is look at this number uh, 3898 3898 which we write in just four numerals and they were writing it like this m m m d c c c x you know that long number was the way they wrote the numbers that's because they only looked at it in terms of addition so if they want to write 20 they'll write x x that is 20 only in terms of addition now when we give the decimal system where we say like 51 51 doesn't mean that 5 plus 1 equal to 6 51 means 50 plus 1 right the whole logic of it they refused to accept it can you believe it 200 years it took for for europe to accept the decimal system and uh, they were inventing newer and newer alphabets so l was 50 c was 100 largest number they had was m which stood for myriad 10000 was represented with m myriad in english also we use the word myriad forms that means actually m stands for 10000 now look at our culture where in rigveda itself we have the nine primary numbers they are mentioned in rigveda by aryabhata's time zero and decimal system were very common not just scholars everybody on the street knew what is decimal system whereas in europe it had lot of persuasion was needed lot of persuasion you know people were told and the uh, uh, the christian uh, rulers of that time they were quite rigid and they said that uh, these are infidel numbers we don't want these infidel numbers and zero was called an evil number because zero was a number they didn't want to accept zero because you can't see zero right so anything you can't zero uh, see anything you can't see is suspicious so they rejected zero and so that's a very funny thing and here that picture that you see is a competition where the you know what's an abacus you know what's an abacus where you move the beads so they were doing calculations using abacus only so if the they they used to be the fastest calc people who do the calculation using abacus and that used to quickly move the beads and give the answer right so they said okay if decimal system is so good let's have a competition and so this is a famous competition between the people on the the guy on the left is using calculation system using decimals and the other guy is using the abacus so after many many years finally they were convinced that only when you use the decimal system you are going to be very fast with multiplication division you know and then finally they accepted games were used as educational aids now look at our culture in which we are not just having classroom sessions where we are teaching things or we are giving lectures on values morals even games were used as educational aids so how many of you know this game i think most of you know this game right but do you know that what you are playing is the british form of the game but the way we were playing is that each of the squares had some guna in it you know like uh, some good quality or a bad quality so if you landed on a square which is which says dharma or satya then you would go up you would go by a ladder to a higher number and if you landed on a square which says kama krodha something like that then you will come down a snake to a lower number now imagine children are playing growing up playing this kind of game so nobody has to tell them this is a good quality this is a bad quality so if you if you are very greedy if you are very lobhi then they 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 know that lobh is a bad quality right so children just uh, learn it as a game and apart from this we had chess shatranj chaturanga came from india and it was a game of strategy where um, it was compulsory for the rajas the their children uh, for the raja uh, rajgharana people everybody had to be good in chess otherwise you can't you want no strategy because you should know 10 moves ahead 20 moves ahead what's going to happen so strategy was taught via chess then playing cards was invented in india tash jo khelte hain to tash through the cards they knew permutation combination all these things were taught via games so this is totally our contribution to the world the these games were so popular they went to the rest of the world they became, they own versions came out of uh, these games in different countries stories these stories were a big tool of ed- education big pedagogical tool uh so you know we know that mahabharata puranas everything comes through so much is taught through the stories even uh, dance drama puppet shows we have stories coming out in so many forms right um panchatantra i'm sure you all know now panchatantra was not just some collection of stories uh, very cute stories they were not that they were actually teaching niti shastra again a genius called vishnu sharma 
Pandit Vishnu Sharma made uh, these series of stories to teach the uh, kings, uh, the princes uh, about Niti Shastra. And so these stories were taught in schools also, Panchatantra. And that's how the children knew all these things like you can't trust everybody or, you know, somebody Ati Vinayam, Dhurta Lakshanam is coming through these stories. Somebody who's being very nice to you, don't trust, be be careful. Or, you know, if you insult your servant thinking that he's, he's just nobody, tomorrow that servant is going to make you lose your monarchy, your position. All these things were taught through stories. And uh, think of students who know the Panchatantra and they go for higher studies and they study Niti Shastra ethics in uh, any university. Then they are learning the theory at, in the university, the theory of Niti Shastra, but they already know what it is from the stories they have learnt in school. So this is such a genius technique where the children are taught in a very elementary form, in the form of stories in the, in the early age. Then they go, when they grow older, they learn the theory behind it, right? This is all our design of education. We had a culture of debate. I can tell you that debate is in the DNA of Indians. That they, there is this joke, right? If there are two Indians, there will be three or four opinions. We are like that. And nobody can take democracy away from us because it is coming from thousands of years, this culture of debate. And debate was part of the education system. It was part of it. A lot of examinations were conducted in the form of debate. So the teachers would look at how the student has understood the subject by making the student debate with another student, okay? It was an educational tool. Apart from that, um, you know, all the physical phenomena in the world, everything was studied through Tarka, like, you know, logic. Why is it happening? Why is the sunrise happening at this time? You know, uh, why are we seeing it in this form, the color? Why is the sun here and not there? All these things we used to apply logic to study. And uh, uh, so we called it Tarka Vidya. You will find the Tarka Vidya mentioned in Ramayana, Mahabharata, Skanda Purana, every so many texts, which shows that debate was a part of our education. And in fact, in Navadvi, in Nadia, the lecturers were selected on the basis of their debating skills. So whoever wanted to teach in the Nadia University, they had to debate. And those who are able to debate well, even if they lose the debate, uh, but if they are using good ways of debating, then they would be selected. Nadia was very important for uh, logic. The kings were very fond of organizing intellectual tournaments. Kings were organizing debate tournaments. So like when you look at the history of the Roman Empire, you look at all the other uh, empires, you will find they are having gladiatorial tournaments. You might have seen those gladiators fighting with each other, killing each other. So fighting, fighting. Now we had those kind of tournaments also where the weapons, you know, we would see who is more skilled in weaponry and fighting. But we also had these debate tournaments where uh, the king would organize the debate tournament and scholars would come from all over the world, all over India, all over the educated world and take part. And the people would see how they are debating. And debating was not like, you know, you just come and start shouting at each other like what you see in TV channels today. It used to be a very, very detailed debate. There were rules of debate. If you go deeper into the subject of Tarka, you will find that there are details given on who is disqualified for debate. So if you move away, the move the goalpost, if you change the topic of the debate, if you talk nonsense during the debate or you talk too much during the debate, everything is mentioned. Every point is mentioned about how to be a good debater. And uh, when you went for a debate, you have to be thorough with the opponent's point of view. You have to, you can't just go and know your point of view. You have to know the opponent's point of view. Then only you go on the stage and debate with that person. That was the culture. Importance of memory training. I think this is a very important thing because today uh, we are not giving importance to memory training. So I'm sure that many of you won't even remember more than three or four mobile phone numbers. You won't know your, all your friends' phone numbers, right? We have degenerated, our brains have degenerated and we hardly are able to store anything in our brain because we think, oh, I can, I will see it in Google. Or I will keep it in my hard drive, I will keep it in my hard drive, I will keep it in my hard drive. But that is wrong. So that is why we have degenerated and we can't remember most of the things. So it is today, today they have found that there is a superior learning curve when your memory is enhanced. If your memory training has been there and you, know, you can remember large, large amounts of things, then your cognitive power increases, the, your grasping power, your understanding, analysis, all that improves. So there has actually been a research uh, study conducted by an Italian uh, uh, professor uh, it, and it's, it showed that there is an improvement caused by Sanskrit chanting. 
so he he examined the brains of the pandits who were chanting the vedas who were learning the vedas and over a period of time the portion of the brain which dealt with cognition it, it became bigger cognition understanding right so memory is something we have neglected in our modern education system um and you know there has been a lot i have uh, eijing eijing was a chinese student who came to study in india and he wrote about the extraordinary memory and intellectual capacity of the brahmanas who are studying all these vedas but that's not just the brahmanas let me tell you that uh, english british travelers and other foreign travelers found that indians in general had very good memory so even the dhobi for example the dhobi is taking clothes from you know 40 50 houses but he never makes a mistake and returns the clothes to the right family so he noticed that and then another traveler wrote that you know he the pharmacist the pers- the person you who gives you medicines for any illness you he has got hundreds of medicines uh, in the shop hundreds of them 200 1000 whatever you ask for the medicine he knows exactly where it is kept and he'll give it to you in within a minute so he said what is this memory but this was very common in india and uh, this is going away it's only left in ved patshalas you know when i went visited ved patshalas they have 11 different ways of learning the veda i think there is some collaboration we must do to learn how the, they memorize because they don't keep repeating repeating in one way they they do this um, you know samhita patha pada patha jata patha uh, dhvaja patha so many different ways of chanting where they leave out one letter then they skip one letter then they do skip three letters or they repeat one letter two times and then go to the, like that you know this like music sa re ga re ga ma sare sare ga ga it's the same thing in music also that same logic has come in order to remember and i think this is called the uh, non linear way of memory training non linear memory retention and we should be using these techniques to remember in those days uh, students remembered entire books in their heads entire ashtadhyayi would be in their head entire amarakosha will be in their head imagine if you have 10 books in your head memorized it's so much easy you can just very quickly come to uh, you know you can analyze data without wasting time looking at something and uh, it also helps in you know if you when you memorize shlokas shlokas you remember all the prarthanas various other you know, shlokas when you remember and at the right time when you are in trouble or you need some knowledge it will come to you you will remember that shloka and it will give you inspiration so even in that sense it is helpful in your life when your memory is good again uh, there was no artificial divide between religion and science because remember our pandits who used to do the havan who used to do the yagya for that they have to make perfect squares they have to make circles rectangles they have to make the yantras they have to draw it that's how the knowledge of geometry got advanced so our religious people were advancing mathematics uh, then they needed the muhurta the exact good time to do some puja or some havan so they need to they developed astronomy that's how all our religious practices were aiding in the development of sciences and maths poetry was full of mathematics the different meters the chanda that you know the chanda shastra is all about uh, different meters in which you do the and lot of mathematics has come from our poetry itself from our knowledge from prosody it is called so meanwhile in europe science had to fight with religion in order to be independent so this divide between religion and science came from the western world because over there you know the galileo story where galileo was saying earth goes around the sun and the the christian clergy did not allow that to uh, did not believe in that didn't want him to talk about it similarly they rejected zero they rejected minus negative numbers all these fights were going on finally the age of enlightenment came and they said let us separate religion from science and that's how it got separated but we never needed to separate it it was all together so now i come to the topic of civilizational pride i think we for the first thing we should be proud about that is that we are the only continuous living civilization in the world right you know that kashi is the oldest city so we are the only people all the others have died off you know the mesopotamians sumerians the persians the greeks the egyptians none of them we don't know what language we don't have their language we don't know their music we don't know anything about what they were doing whereas ours we still have all of that we should be proud of that in the least now um, nept nep 2020 also mentions that we need rootedness and pride in india so it is now institutionalized and the journey has begun now kala based education this is something that we have forgotten 
that we have all made it now very dry and uh, boring in our education. So, Kala, remember that we were the land of Kala, 64 Kalas, Chonsat Kala. Education also meant that you should know some uh, art form, music, dance, painting, uh, kuch bhi. You know, you should have some Kala that you should know, two, three Kala you should know, you should know singing, something. Uh, hair styling, interior decoration. If you see the Chaucet Kala, if you see the list of it, it includes many interesting things like solving puzzles. If somebody gives you a coded language and says something, you should understand what that person is saying. Or on the spot, you should be able to code something. You should give, say something in a code form, right? Or metallurgy. All these things were arts. And uh, most of the people knew one or two arts at least. Singing, dancing, something. They would know it apart from whatever they are studying in the uh, and it was part of the education. It was not like abhi jase hota hai ki aap school mein jayenge, aap science, math sab padhenge. After extra class leke you have to study uh, music or dance or drama. Whereas in those times everything was together. In the school itself, in the uh, educational system itself, all these were included. Martial arts, it was all part of it. Bhaskaracharya, the famous Bhaskaracharya, the greatest mathematician according to some people, the greatest in the world. He composed his mathematical problems in poetry form. Okay, if you read the book Leela Vati, easily available, you can download it, Leela Vati. Sanskrit, it's written in Sanskrit and it is all full of mathematical problems and it is set, it is addressed to a girl. A girl is being told, oh beautiful one, can you solve this problem? Oh a girl with the lovely eyes, can you solve this problem? So this already shows you that girls are studying mathematics. So if anybody tells you women were not getting education, Show them Leelavati. Leelavati is written clearly for a girl uh, for mathematics. And uh, so these were all poetical uh, treatises. And if you study Bhaskar, so imagine a maths professor today who is giving you a problem in uh, poetry form. Can you imagine? It's just impossible because we have separated the arts from the sciences and the maths. But in those days, they would compose the problem in poetry form, which would make it interesting for the students because they learn the poem, you can, they can sing it and also then they can solve it. Right? That is the way it was. Now, being embedded in the arts, I believe, it makes you very uh, artistic. So, if you study the arts, if it is compulsory for everybody to study some form of art, architecture, uh, you know, anything, rangoli making, textile designing, then it makes you get the saundarya drishti. A lot of us don't have it now because we are so dry in the, our education system is so dry that we don't have that sense of aesthetics. We don't know about rasa and bhava. Right? We don't know about the Shringara, Hasya, Karuna, Raudra, all the Navarasa. And you can see that even in the movies that are being made today, complete nonsensical movies that is coming, that are coming from Bollywood, where the filmmaker has not given any thought on what Rasa is he trying to portray, what is the Bhava he wants to show. He just makes some kind of story which suits his uh, liking, which is not the way it was in ancient times. They used to give thought on, thought to this Rasa and Bhava. Okay, And this comes from the arts, it doesn't come from the sciences. To give you an example of the, you know, the difference between ancient and modern education, I took this picture of uh, a well, step well in Gujarat. Now these have been made by engineers of those times. And look at how they have made a functional structure, it is able to harvest uh, rainwater, but it is also so beautiful. So many beautiful carvings, embellishments. And then look on the right side, which is a modern tube well which is just a hole in the ground with some pipe and some pump, that's it. Is this education? Our education is teaching us to make these kind of things. And even today when I go to a reservoir, which has been built by the top engineers, I'm just seeing it's just a hole actually. It's just a square hole or a rectangular hole. But if you go to the, I went to Jammu. I was invited to speak in Jammu and I explored the region. Beautiful wells with carvings which are depicting the history of Jammu, which are showing the heroes of Jammu all around the, the little reservoirs that they had. Bauli, Bauli. By the way, Delhi also has a lot of beautiful Baulis which are all lying in disuse, completely filled with rubbish. So this is what we are suffering from the, because of the difference in our education. Now being rooted. Why we should be rooted? Why should we be uh, aware of our heritage and why should we be rooted? It makes you authentic. It makes you confident, relaxed and comfortable. What I feel is that when you are close to your roots, then you, then you know what is the real you, who you are, right? 
um, and that has been part of my journey as well. In the beginning, when I was uh, studying engineering, then I went abroad, right? Then there's a way we are trying to be somebody else. We are trying to talk like somebody else. We are dressing like some some other culture, what it has taught. So the moment I started getting close to my history, my culture, I started wearing saris and I walked confidently into any place, any conference. Um, and, um, you know, of course, it also starts some kind of stereotyping because if they see me in a sari with bindi, I get a lot of uh, funny questions like, okay, what caste do you belong to? Uh, did you have a, did you, were you forced to marry somebody or did you, you know, what kind of marriage? All these uh, uh, things they have, the prejudices, but that's fine. I answer all those questions to the best of my ability. But the fact is that you become very confident when you're rooted. That is something we should all remember. And it also makes you have meaningful relationships. The moment you don't put on an accent and you don't try to be something else, life becomes meaningful. Then with the relationships within the family, relationships with your colleagues, everything's, everything becomes very real. It's true to you, being true to yourself, right? Um, and this is a picture of Sridhar Vembu. Sridhar Vembu was, uh, is, uh, is the founder of a company called Zoho Corporation, which is an IT company. He founded it in America. He went to study in America, the usual route. And then one fine day he said, I want to be close to my roots. So he came back to India, Tamil Nadu. He started wearing dhoti and everything. And uh, he said, I'm going to recruit these rural people of Tamil Nadu. I'm going to give them training in programming. They don't need to go to some city outside and study programming and lose their culture. They will be right here and I will train them. And then he absorbed all of them in his company. So now his company has all these local people who are well versed in programming and they are totally rooted in their culture. And uh, Sridhar Vembu's lifestyle is so lovely. He wakes up in the morning, goes for a walk around the village. He goes for a swim in the village pond. Um, he has his conferences in an open air uh, room, conference room is open air in the in his village house. So this is what, you know, being when you find your roots, there is so much that you can do. You know, you, there's no need to say that oh, you become backward. Oh, if we go back to that ancient lifestyle, you're going to become backward. No, no, no. You can start a business. You can do anything. You can be rich, right? Keeping your roots intact. If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it is a part of a tree. This is a famous quote by Michael Christian that, you know, if you don't know your history, very good. You can still live, you can eat, you can do everything. But you are like a leaf which doesn't know that it's part of a huge tree, a tree full of so many other leaves, roots, stems, so much, so much of connections. But you, you just don't know it because you think that, uh, because you don't know history. So this quote is very important. Now, there's a new discourse about decoloniality. Today in America, Europe, they're all actually talking about decoloniality, which means that, you know, we all have been colonized. We know that we were ruled by the British. That was the worst damage done to our psyche, where we all started looking down on ourselves. We started thinking that we are all so stupid. We are all so ugly. We are all dark skinned and uh, we don't know how to, you know, talk. But look at the West. We have to be like them. And so then when the Macaulay's policy came around, I'm sure you all know Macaulay, how uh, English medium became the instruction, language of inst uh, instruction. And then we were made to hate our own culture, right? So there is a whole uh, discipline of decoloniality that is becoming popular in the US. But for some reason in India, nobody is focusing on it. So the Native Americans in America, they are being, they are exerting this decoloniality that they want to be decolonized. Africans are talking about decoloniality. So it's time for Indians also to talk about it. We have lost a lot of terminology because of losing contact with our roots. So if somebody says, what is the point of knowing our history? Because you know, it's, it's not relevant to us today. Well, as I told you, you will become like a leaf which doesn't know it's part of a tree, but you will also lose a lot of terminology which the Western world is taking from our culture, our Shastras. For example, non-sleep deep rest, NSDR, it's a very huge technique now, it's patented and I saw that the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai, is telling everybody, hey, are you having problems with uh, insomnia? You're not able to sleep? Please uh, learn this technique called non-sleep deep rest. There are lots of videos that are very helpful. And I was shocked. This is nothing but yoga nidra. Yoga Nidra is a technique in yoga where they teach you how to relax, how to breathe slowly so that you completely relax. That is being now marketed as non-sleep 
depressed. Of course, they made some changes to it so that nobody will say it's yoga nidra, but it's the same thing. And it's because we were sleeping. We didn't know that our knowledge is being taken away in bits and pieces. So this happened. Uh, the other one is alternate nostril breathing. I am sure you all know what it is. Alternate nostril breathing is pranayama. But over there in America, they call it, a lot of them call it alternate nostril breathing. And nobody knows it came from India. They don't know because it's, oh, some fancy technique being taught in America. And they have invented it. Some new name they'll give it. Even jalneti, you know, the way you put water. Jalneti is now, uh, they call it neti pot. It is sold in America and called neti pot. There is no mention of India or Sanskrit. Uthak Baithak. This is the most funny of all. Where, you know, this punishment that used to be given to small children. Ye kaan aise ke, upar niche karo, hundred times. This naughty students used to be told. Now it is called super brain yoga. Super brain yoga. Because they found in a study that the ch uh, when you do this Uthak Baithak so many times, then your brain becomes very relaxed and the hyperactive children, they become very quiet, they become relaxed after doing it. And for older people also, anyone who is hyperactive, Uthak Baithak is a very good uh, this thing, but it's called Super Brain Yoga. Some great guy has given it the name Super Brain Yoga. Now, why did we not do it? Why did we not think about this? So, we were, because we lost contact with this. We thought, Ye kya hai, Uthak Baithak, we didn't even know that it's, a, it's actually an asana. Okay. Uh, so, what happens is that when you are deracinated, when you are uh, decoupled, when you have lost connection with your heritage, then what will happen? It's open for stealing by anybody because you didn't take hold of it. You didn't claim it for yourself. Um, systems approach. Systems approach is popular across all disciplines today. It is nothing but the Purusha approach. Purusha. So, Purusha has different parts, legs, hands heart, brain. So, so our gurus used to look at everything in terms of the purusha approach. So, who is the brain over here? You know, there's an organization. So, there is somebody who is the brain, who is managing, who is thinking. So that is the brain. Okay, somebody who is doing the work, legs. So, this is the way we used to, and they're all dependent. Nobody can cut off. You can't say that, oh, cut off this person and we can, manage. they know that, okay, this person is the brain. This, this one is the, the arms, the bhuja. So, the systems approach, we should have been calling it Purusha approach and we should have patented it before they did it, right? So, this is the reason I feel that we should wake up. We should wake up and connect with our culture and our Shastras, our Bharatiya, Jnana Parampara so that we can, we won't allow these terms to be stolen from us. Now, this is a picture which is in my book. I worked a lot on this. It's in this book. How Indian knowledge went from India to the rest of the world. It's a big, the longest chapter in my book. How Indian knowledge went to Greece, Egypt, it went to Europe, it went to Japan, it went to Persia. It's a very, very interesting story. How our knowledge was taken, translated. There was a translation revolution by which our knowledge, all the Shastras were translated first into Arabic and Persian. So, um, this um, the Greeks. So, the Greeks were already in touch with India for, for many, many centuries. So, there was exchange going on. And uh, Pythagoras, for example, was deeply influenced by Indian mathematics. But for some reason, the European world calls it Pythagorean Pythagoras theorem. And we can clearly see that we have a whole history of using the, uh, the same theorem, the Shulva Sutras, the Baudhayana theorem. We have a history of using it. But Pythagoras, in fact, is uh, mentioned by the Greek scholars themselves. Greek scholars themselves are saying, uh, and the references are in my book. If you buy my book, the references are there. Where they are saying, you know, Eusebius, Apollonius, these are all Greek scholars who are saying that Pythagoras took his knowledge from India, from Indians. So, in this manner, a lot of knowledge went from India. The knowledge of medicine was very, very, very valued. Uh, so, uh, doctors from India, Vaidyas were, uh, were invited to settle down in Baghdad. Remember Baghdad, when early, when Islam was new, the caliphs, the khalifas were ruling over in Baghdad. So, they invited a lot of Indian scholars to settle there. And make them translate all these into Persian and Arabic. Are we short of time? Short of time. Okay, then let me just speed up. So, this is just a picture to show you how knowledge went from India to the rest of the world. I just want to tease you a little bit about the number 108. A lot of us, we do Japa for 108 times. Surya Namaskar, we do 108 times. What is this number 108? Does anyone know here? So, sometimes we think it is superstition that we are doing something, but if you go deeper, you will find the logic. 108 is the ratio of the diameter of the sun 
the uh, uh, diameter of the sun and diameter of the earth. So, the, the sun's diameter is 108 times the diameter of the earth. The distance between the earth and the sun is 108 times the diameter of the sun. The distance between the earth and the moon is 108 times the moon's diameter. So, see this number is a magic number. It keeps coming in astronomy and our gurus realize that this, if it was 110, if it was some other number, we would not exist on this earth. So, this is a magic number 108. So, they said, let's do Japa 108 times. Let's do Namaskar 108 times. So, whenever you see something which looks superstitious or stupid, please just take a step back and try to find out whether there is some root root if it's whether there is some basis in science uh, so you're not giving me enough time so i'm just saying that when we connect with the ancient knowledge we will probably solve today's problems there are a lot of today's problems that can be solved with ancient knowledge of uh, ayurveda agriculture water management there is there are a lot of gems waiting to be discovered over there now this is einstein and his famous quote is that you cannot solve problems with the same thinking used to create the problems. Now, today's problems, when you look at them, global warming, climate change, so many problems, psychological problems, uh, garbage, pollution, none of those problems came with the Bharatiya Drishti. None of them came when we were rooted in our Bharatiya Parampara. They have come from the Western thinking. So, if you want to solve these problems, you have to go back to your Bharatiya Drishti. Then maybe there is a chance you will solve these problems. So, um, I think what I am trying to say here is that, you know, we never had a subject called environmental sciences. In ancient India, there was no subject because every subject was connected with the environment. So, if you do engineering, you have to take care that you are not destroying a forest, you are not destroying animals. Any subject you do, you, you are rooted in the environment, in nature, Prakriti. So, there was no separate subject. That is something to think about. Brahmacharya, quick, I just want to tell you that in our student period in ancient times, Brahmacharya had to be developed. Where you develop control over your thoughts, your sleep and everything, that is a very important part of character building. So, in our ancient uh, uh, Shiksha uh, Paddhati, it was not just teaching you different subjects, it was about building your character during the student period. So, in the first 25 years of your life, if your character is not built, then it is very hard to do it later on. All the control, you know, they would, they would teach you Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Ash, the Ashtanga Yoga. So, they would teach you the techniques by which you will be able to control your desires. It was not just like, hey, you know, stop thinking about girl, boys, stop dreaming about boys, you know, telling the girls, a young girl. It's not going to help that, you know, don't dream about that hero in that movie. They are going to teach you how to control your thoughts. They were techniques. And that's why I feel that today the absence of Brahmacharya has led to a lot of these problems we are having. The fraud, domestic violence, alcoholism, depression, sexual violence. We have neglected the role of building Brahmacharya in the student period. That's something we need to take from ancient India. Our educational heritage makes us unique. What we forget is that today all the students around the world are looking like each other, talking like each other, you know. All of all, most of them wearing jeans, eating pizza, watching Hollywood movies, drinking coke, taking selfies, making Instagram posts. So you know when you apply for colleges in America and various places, they want to they want somebody who's different, but they're not finding the college essays that are submitted in order to get admission. All those essays, there is very hard for them to find somebody who's unique, and that's why I tell young students that if you connect to your Bharatiya parampara. If you get a Bharatiya Drishti, whatever the essays that you write, the way you conduct yourself in interviews will be very unique because Bharatiya Drishti will not teach all of you to be the same. You will use that, uh, that Gyan to develop your own thoughts and be your own person. So, please connect so that you are becoming more eligible for the best colleges of the world. So, uh, can, I get, can I get five minutes more? So, just a few points on, on my vision for Vikasit Bharat in the cultural way cultural format. I think we need a society where members are specialists in their preferred discipline but also have a basic knowledge of Itihasa and Shastra such as Natya Shastra, Artha Shastra, Nyaya Shastra. So that's what I told you about, rooted in Bharatiya Drishti. So come 2047, I want that all of us are rooted in our Shastras. We must be well versed in at least five languages, all of us, okay. The Matra Bhasha, the Kshetra Bhasha, the Desha Bahulya Bhasha, which is, which is Hindi in our case, because it is the majority language is Desha Bahulya Bhasha, is Hindi. 
विश्व बहुल्य भाषा इज इंग्लिश द लैंग्वेज विच इज स्पोकन मोस्टली अराउंड द वर्ल्ड इंग्लिश देन प्रमातृ भाषा विच इज द मदर ऑफ द मदर टंग विच इज संस्कृत सो यू शुड नो योर मातृभाषा योर क्षेत्र भाषा द रीजनल लैंग्वेज एंड योर द पॉपुलर लैंग्वेज द मेजोरिटी लैंग्वेज द इंटरनेशनल मेजोरिटी लैंग्वेज एंड योर मदर ऑफ मदर टंग्स विच इज संस्कृत so if you know these languages they are like the five fingers of the hand you know you would be able to grip something the more languages of course if you know more than five languages better rooted be rooted in some color by 2047 i hope that uh, everybody is rooted in some color music dance painting they also patronize artists and they create an ecosystem of art lovers now everybody may not be good at singing but at least you can appreciate somebody who is singing well you can appreciate the ragas that are being sung so you have to create that ecosystem of art appreciation and we should know the folk songs of the region people should know the folk songs of the region songs related to childbirth marriage different festivals like teej holi and all that you should not be depending on movies to give you your songs like today if there is you know holi comes and i'll say ask you to sing a holi song they'll say uh, holi ke din der dil khil jate hain and i'm thinking what the hell are you singing this is not the holi song you should be knowing listen to malini avasti the various beautiful folk songs she is uh, singing right and whichever language if you are from karnataka you should know the uh, folk songs of that region right loka sangeet so he, the movies should not be framing our ideas of music and culture we should be going directly to the grassroots people must know the significance of their customs and rituals and not follow them blindly please so by 2047 if somebody says hey why are you lighting this lamp before this program why are you doing why are you wearing the mangal sutra we should be able to give good logical answers to this all of us should know the thinking behind the customs the depth behind this custom we should be able to represent it well right people i hope that in 2047 by then people are following the tradition of their grama devatas and kula devatas something we have all forgotten we all come from some gram we all come from different kula right and there is a kula devi kula devata there is a grama devata now we don't know who they are i have been on my journey i found i know my kul devis and i'm going to be at you should go to the temple of the whichever kula you belong to kula devi offer flowers give your respect because there are subtle energies that come from doing all that if you let that energy die out it affects the country very badly so this is a part of the cultural renaissance we need that we need to connect to our kul devis and grama devis uh and we all have to become spiritually strong and always moving towards greater self awareness this should be we are indians if we are indians then self awareness is a very important thing in our life we are not doing something just like that i mean going through the motions of life we are moving towards higher and higher self awareness atma gyan so that ultimately we understand the universe that is the ultimate goal also we should all have a basic knowledge of agriculture and gardening this is also my vision for 2047 please we all have to be in some of the gurukulas that i visited recently i saw that all the children are learning agriculture first one hour in the morning they are doing they are growing something they are taking care of the plants we need to do it we learned a lesson during covid when nobody could go out that is the time when lot of people started doing gardening so that they can grow their own plants and crops okay The, uh, the 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 importance of different seasons the importance of seasons uh, the impact of seasons on our body all this will come when we do this uh, when we get connected to agriculture and gardening so with this i come to the end of my talk thank you very much for your patience my uh,